I think we might get started. Hello everyone and welcome to the GMHBA Help You at Home Lunchtime Webinar Series. My name is Sue Rankin and I'm a Director of GMHBA, but I'm also Chair of the Board's Health, uh, Health Services Committee and in that capacity I'm hosting today's webinar. Before we begin today's session, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we all meet today. For me, it's the Bunwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. For those of you from the Geelong region, it's the Wathaurong people. I pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. Today, we'll have a presentation from our invited guest speaker, whom I'll introduce shortly. During the presentation, please feel free to ask questions. There's a chat function on your screen. For those using an iPad, it's on the top right hand side. For those using computers, it's usually on the bottom of the screen. We'll address questions throughout the, the webinar and um, there'll also be time at the end for additional questions. At the end of today's webinar, I'm going to hand over to Amanda Bevan, GMHBA's Head of Marketing and Communication, who's going to facilitate the Q&A session and conducted an important short poll, which enables us to inform future webinars for the Healthier at Home series. Please, please stay online and complete that service. It's really important to us. Now I'd like to int introduce Amanda C. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Amanda's a clinical psychologist at This Way Up, an, on an online provider of courses at the Clinical Research Unit for Anxiety and Depression, also known as CRUFAD. At This Way Up, Amanda develops resources, provides clinical consultation, and helps people get the most out of the courses available. Her role at CRUFAT also involves treating anxiety and depressive disorders and working on clinical trials. Today's webinar will give an overview of typical responses we're all experiencing during this pandemic, and I'm sure there's lots of those, and psychological tools that can equip you to feel more in control of your well-being in the face of uncertainty and disruption in life. It will also help you identify whether feeling low or anxious has become more problematic for you or your loved ones and what you can do to get help early on. Now over to you, Amanda. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. Just bear with me as I get my PowerPoint presentation up. Uh, I work at St Vincent's Hospital uh, based in Sydney um, and CRUFAD um, is a joint venture between the University of New South Wales and the St Vincent's Hospital. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today to be talking about a very important topic um, and it's really about building resilience for getting through COVID-19. Um, now, as Sue mentioned, um, if there are some quick questions that I can answer throughout the presentation, I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, if there's something that requires a lengthier response, um, please do wait till the end. Um, and what I'd also ask um, is that uh, any questions of a really uh, personal or sensitive nature um, also be refrained from being asked in this forum um, and instead be directed toward um, your GP or another mental health professional in, in that instance. So today I'm going to be covering how COVID-19 impacts uh, our emotional well-being. The bulk of this presentation will be about 10 tips to get through this pandemic as best we can. Now, I'm very aware that some of you listening here today might be uh, in Victoria um, in the lockdown. Um, my thoughts are with you. Unfortunately, this presentation won't be covering how to get through a lockdown. I think you can um, do a whole presentation um, just based on that but I will be directing you toward a helpful resource um, later in the presentation. Lastly, I'll be talking about how can we know when extra support is needed and how do we go about getting it? So how does COVID-19 impact our emotional well-being, or in other words, how we feel within ourselves day to day? As I was thinking about this uh, topic, um, something that struck me was how every single area of our lives has been impacted by this pandemic whether it be um, our physical and mental health, uh, how things uh, run at home, um, how we go about conducting um, our schooling, our work, our studies, or even our plans for retirement. Um, of course, the way we socialize has been uh, changed drastically. Uh, how we eat, how we worship, um, how we access um, services, how we do our entertainment and leisure has all been turned on its head. 
And significant life events have also changed a lot in the way that we conduct them and in the way that we experience them. And um, in some ways, a lot of the changes that we've experienced have been really difficult and really stressful. And there might be some aspects of your life that might have um, actually become easier or might have been improved as a result of COVID. And I think it's really important that we uh, recognise that there's a full range of experiences that we've all had in response to this pandemic. So in 1943, uh, a psychologist called Abraham Maslow came up with a theory called the hierarchy of needs. Um, and as you can see here in this triangle, what this theory assumes is that humans universally have a fundamental set of needs that we are all driven and all motivated to meet. The most fundamental needs are toward the bottom of the triangle, so basic needs. We need to feel um, secure in that we have food, water, warmth, clothing and rest. Um, we need to also feel uh, safe um, within a home and we also need to feel safe um, from uh, our lives being at risk, such as being threatened by a virus. And so COVID has actually threatened our ability to get a lot of these basic needs met. And the reason why I put that picture of the toilet paper there is because all of this panic buying, fear about not having toilet paper, pasta, flour, all the basics, I think really demonstrate um, this particular theory, which says that when we're worried that we can't afford basic things or when we're worried that we can't access basic things, we become very anxious about getting those needs met. And when those needs um, aren't able to be met because of, that, uh, because of the pandemic, we can become angry, we can become frustrated, we can also become very sad because we notice that there's a gap or a discrepancy between what it is that we need and our ability to meet that. Next are the psychological needs, such as belongingness and love and connection. And I think this picture of this couple through COVID um, hugging and kissing also demonstrates how our capacity to be in touch with loved ones and that physical touch that we're um, missing um, has been threatened. And lastly, um, self-fulfillment needs, such as being able to uh, meet our life goals and dreams has also gone out the window because of what's happened through COVID. <clears throat> so here are some really common emotional experiences um, that we've all had during COVID. Um, these are just looking at this list. It's not exhaustive, but I know that I've experienced many of these emotions and you may have too. There's so much anxiety. Um, there's a lot of anger about what's happened um, and a lot of resentment toward other people, not following restrictions or not doing what they're meant to do. There's a lot of sadness and grief about um, losing loved ones to COVID, about lost opportunities. Um, the way we've had to grieve has changed because um, we, we can't touch each other in the same way. We can't gather in big groups in the same way. Even joyous celebrations um, like weddings or having a baby or having a party can't happen in the same way that we would like. And as a result of that, those joyous celebrations can also be touched by grief. There's a lot of helplessness um, where we feel out of control. There's also some positive emotions that um, people have experienced as well. So some people have talked about how this pandemic has made them value the things that are most important in life in a way that perhaps they didn't appreciate prior to COVID. There's so much uncertainty that we're all having to sit with. When will a vaccine come? Will my COVID test come back negative? Uh, when will borders open and I can see my loved ones again? When can I go back to work? When will I find work? When will JobKeeper um, be extended to? And on and on and on. And sitting with this amount of uncertainty is so incredibly difficult. So here are 10 tips to get through this pandemic as best we can. Now, as I go through these, um, you might find that you're doing some or all of these already, and that's great, but I hope that even just being reminded of what these are um, will be an encouragement for you to keep going. And as I go through this list, you might even find there are some things you haven't thought about, um, but I hope that you can walk away uh, with at least one useful or practical tool um, to help yourself get through this as best you can. So I've started to think of this pandemic as being similar to a marathon in the sense that I think we've had to um, unfortunately accept that we're in this for the long haul. The difference is that it's not a marathon that we signed up for and it's a marathon where we don't know where the finish line is and we don't know when we're going to reach it. And because there is so much out of our control, 
what we can do is we can focus on controlling the things that we can. And one of the things that we can control is building up our resilience. And there's lots of psychological training we can do um, in order to make that happen. So tip number one, your experience is your experience. So the way that this pandemic has affected me will differ from the way that it's impacted you um, and everyone else listening to this webinar and everyone else in the world. Uh, it's important to acknowledge that every person is facing different hurdles, different challenges. Only you are in your own shoes and only you are living out the reality of your situation day to day. So allow yourself to feel what you feel. Um, and do this without criticizing yourself, minimizing your experience, comparing yourself to others or feeling guilty. So some examples of that of, uh, we could have thoughts like, um, I shouldn't be upset about this when what this other person is going through is so much worse. Or we could um, beat ourselves up for not being able to be tough enough um, or, or feeling like we're weak for reacting the way we are. Or as I mentioned before, if you are um, actually enjoying some parts of COVID, um, you needn't feel guilty about that. It may be that pre-COVID life was, was harder, harder for you or more hectic for you. Um, and, and that's okay that COVID has brought about some positive changes in your life. It is possible to be empathic and compassionate to what other people are going through. And at the same time, Acknowledge and give yourself permission to feel and to react in whatever ways you might be as well. Two, identify and use your personal strengths. So it would be useful sometime today for you to take a moment to reflect on what your personal strengths are. We all have them. I've only just listed a few uh, examples here. It could be your sense of humor. Um, it could be your positive attitude. It could be your resourcefulness and the list goes on and on. If you're finding it hard to think about what your personal strengths are, have a think about what other people might have noticed about you or said about you. And even though you might not have lived through a pandemic before, chances are that you've been through some difficult times in your life before. And it's useful to have a think about how your personal strengths helped you get through those difficult times previously and how you could muster up those same strengths so you can play um, to your existing strengths now or ones that have worked for you in the past, or you can cultivate new ones. Number three, endure by being as fit as you can. Now, I put that fuel tank um, meter up there as a good reminder for us that in order to keep running this marathon, our fuel tank needs to be as full as possible and we need to keep topping it up regularly. So healthy eating, good sleep, exercise, they're all things that we've heard before but prioritizing those things um, as fuel for both our body and our mind, because we know that the mind-body connection is, is really strong, is so important. <clears throat> now, there's been a lot of focus in recent months about looking out for COVID symptoms, getting tested for them and seeing the doctor for them. And that is so important. We need to be doing that. At the same time, sometimes a lot of this focus on COVID can mean that we're ignoring or we're dismissing other kinds of physical health complaints that we might be having. And so that's why it's really important that you seek medical attention for any health concerns, um, whether they be coronavirus related or whether they are something else. And it's important that we use coping strategies that are helpful both in the short term and in the long term. So for example, alcohol and drugs might give us some temporary numbness or relief, um, but in the long term, we know that they can really affect our mood and our anxiety levels. And they can also, if dependence um, is developed, add extra problems to your life than the ones you're already facing now as a result of COVID related stress. If you are someone who has chronic health conditions, please keep getting them treated, taking your medications, seeing your doctors, seeing your clinicians. And this last one is so important. So take care of yourself so you can take care of others. If our tank, if our tank is running low, there's only so much that we can pour out and give to other people. If you're in a position of caring for children, caring for other people or in a management responsibility at work, it's really important that you look after yourself so that you can look after others. Because when we ignore our own needs, we're at greater risk of burning out. Four, manage stress in helpful ways. Um, so when we're feeling really overwhelmed, problems can just, be, can just feel really big and insurmountable. 
So it's often really helpful to try and focus on one step or on one thing at a time. Break tasks up into smaller parts that are going to be more manageable and more achievable. So you can tick them off and feel a sense of accomplishment. If the thing that you're stressed about is something that you can do um, something directly about, then problem solve. It's really important that you keep your anxious thoughts in check. So we know that anxiety can make us think in unhelpful ways, such as assuming the worst case scenario, um, catastrophizing or thinking in very all or nothing terms. Uh, but when this happens, what can happen is that it can actually make our anxiety levels um, go up even more. And so if you're noticing that you're starting to think in unhelpful ways, um, try to challenge your thoughts to make them more balanced or to make them more realistic um, or more helpful. And if, you're, if you've done that, but you're finding that these anxious thoughts are still plaguing you, try your best to shift your attention onto something else. Five, increase positive emotions. So it's really uh, normal that a lot of our moods have been affected by COVID. Um, a lot of us might be feeling hopeless. Um, we might be sad or we might be grieving or we might be disappointed and rightly so that 2020 hasn't turned out in the way that we had hoped or in the way that we'd wanted. So in order to level out our dips in mood, we can do that by deliberately finding ways to increase positive emotions. So one way we can do that is every day we can plan to do at least one pleasurable activity that gives you a sense of fun or enjoyment or relaxation and at least one achievement activity that gives you a sense of accomplishment or self-esteem. Plan ahead because without planning you probably won't do it um, but then once you've made that plan um, push through and do it regardless of how you feel. When we're feeling low, it's really easy to let our moods dictate what we do, or in most cases, what we don't end up doing. Um, but if you've got a plan, pushing through with doing that is going to put you in a better position to experience some of those um, uh, experiences of pleasure and achievement. Chances are that COVID's restrictions have gotten in the way of you doing the things you normally like and enjoy. Um, so for example, if you can't go to the gym anymore or you're not comfortable in doing that, um, try to be flexible um, and creative in finding um, other ways in order to do that. So we've just got a question here about why is sleep so important? Uh, sleep is really important for a whole number of reasons. Um, so sleep is really important for our physical well-being. Um, so uh, there's a strong connection between um, our immune systems and um, the amount of sleep and rest we get. Um, so we are more prone to getting sick um, if we're sleep deprived. Um, sleep is also really important um, to be able to function and to focus day to day. So you might notice that if you haven't had a good night's sleep, um, your memory might be a bit, um, a, a bit um, uh, shady or you might find yourself forgetting things or just not being able to attend to things as much as you like. Um, it's also really important uh, for your emotional health as well. So when we haven't had good sleep, uh, we are prone to feeling um, more anxious um, or more low or more irritable. Um, and so there's a whole host of reasons why sleep is really important. Uh, at what point should we seek professional help? And what are some signs that I or my family member can't do it alone? Um, if you please be patient with that, I'll be covering that a little bit later down the track in the presentation. But they, those are really great questions. Thank you. Okay, six, expose yourself to media wisely. So um, media exposure can trigger such intense emotions. So um, it's anxiety provoking to be hearing statistics of new infections, deaths, new local outbreaks near you. Um, it can be really upsetting and really distressing to be seeing certain images from around the world, overrun hospitals, coffins and things like that. And so we can fall into one of two unhelpful extremes. So one might be that we completely avoid the news altogether. The second extreme is that we obsessively check and that we're constantly on the news. Um, and neither of those extremes are particularly helpful. So it's what's more helpful is to actually strike a good balance somewhere in between where you consume enough news so that you can keep up to date with what you need to know you can follow the health advice that's being recommended and that you can make or change your plans accordingly in light of the new rules um, and the new guidelines that are constantly changing day to day. 
If you're feeling overwhelmed by the news or if you're, if you're feeling that it really is affecting your mood, you can create some limits around that. So for example, you might choose to only watch the news or read the paper once a day. Um, or you might choose um, to do that during certain times of the day where you're going to be less affected. So for example, um, if reading the news is going to upset you and it's going to get in the way of you being able to um, work, for example, then you might choose to read the news outside of work hours. If you find that watching the news just before you go to bed at night is going to make it hard for you to go to sleep because it makes you tense or it makes you anxious, then, and then choose a time earlier in the day so that it's going to be easier for you to fall asleep. Seven, balance what you think and talk about. Um, so it's really normal because of how much COVID has affected us to be thinking and talking about it a lot. Um, but I know that personally, sometimes I'm just sick of talking about um, COVID with my friends and family and my colleagues. And there are other things that I'd like to be talking about to give myself some sense of normality. Um, it can be so consuming. And so one way that you can try to balance that is to make sure that you're doing other activities um, that are not um, touched by COVID um, if possible, and also talking about other topics. Um, so taking some time out and breaks from COVID um, are going to help you so that you don't feel so um, bogged down and weighed down and fatigued um, by this pandemic. Eight, stay connected and reach out. So this one you've probably heard so much of. Um, the term social distancing is often unhelpful because really it's about physical distancing, not relational distancing. And so um, if, if seeing people face to face is not possible or if it's something that you're not comfortable doing, um, then do please uh, be making use of technology. Um, now, I know that sometimes we can feel quite fatigued and think, oh, not another Zoom call. I'm just I'm just so over it. Um, it's really understandable to be feeling like that. And at the same time, it's also a really useful tool to be making sure that we're staying connected with others. Do be looking out for those who are more vulnerable to isolation, even if you're not feeling particularly lonely or isolated. It could be a, a new mum. It could be someone who's got chronic health conditions who is finding it harder to get out and see people. It could be someone who, um, because of uh, border restrictions, is separated from their family and natural supports. Um, there are lots of people for whom um, just a phone call or a text message or a video call um, could make such a big difference. And if you're feeling like you're needing more social connection, um, have the courage to ask for it. So it could be that you ask a friend or a family member, is it okay if, if we have a video call once a week? Or is it okay if we just keep in touch a little bit more? If you are in a position where you're not in lockdown and you can meet in person or you feel comfortable meeting in person, um, it's important that um, you talk with the other person or other people you're planning to do that with about A, if you and the other people are comfortable doing that, and B, what your preferences are around where you want to go and what you want to do. So for example, some people might not be comfortable being indoors in a cafe, but they might be okay going for a walk in a park. Some people might not want to go to hotspot areas or to go to certain cafes. But having this open dialogue beforehand is really important so that each person feels like their needs and their preferences are being listened to. And it's also um, really crucial that we respect that everyone's going to have different um, levels of risk that they're willing to take and different preferences in terms of what they're comfortable or not comfortable with. Nine, look after yourself in lockdown. Um, lockdown, I, I can't imagine what it's like, but it must be really, really difficult. Um, so being kind and compassionate um, with yourself and with other people and taking one day or even an hour, one hour at a time when the going gets tough um, might be able to help you to keep going. Our colleagues at the Black Dog Institute have come up with some um, really specific resources to help you get through lockdown. And there are two resources I particularly want to draw your attention to. There's the personal wellbeing checklist. Um, and there's the self-care plan. So they're really practical tools, they're templates, but you can actually personalize them to yourself to make sure that you're looking after yourself and that you're coming up with a plan um, under different areas of your life to make sure um, that that fuel tank is as full as possible as we spoke about before. Uh, the last tip, give yourself credit and reach out if you need to. So um, I work under the assumption that we're all coping the best we can with what we have. 
So do be looking out for small wins. Um, so at the end of the day, if there's something um, hard that you achieved or if there's a tricky situation that you got through, give yourself a pat on the back for it. It's okay to need extra support, uh, whether it be from your natural supports like friends or family or professional supports, which I'll be speaking about soon. Remove the stigma around asking for extra help. So sometimes the stigma can come from um, societal views about mental health. Sometimes they can come from um, friends and family, but more often than not, the stigma can um, actually come from ourselves. So sometimes we think that we should be able to cope with this or we should be able to get through this better than what we are. My encouragement to you would be to remove those shoulds, get rid of the stigma that you're placing on yourself. Um, and if you do need extra help, that's completely okay to be getting. If you are someone who had pre-existing mental health issues like anxiety, depression or something else prior to COVID, it's really important that you keep looking after your well-being through COVID. We know that life stress um, can make you more vulnerable to relapse, so please do be working with your clinician around staying well. If you'd like some extra tools um, for uh, coping with COVID, we've actually uh, got this website supporting you through the COVID pandemic and this is what the, um, the landing page looks like. These are some of the tools that we've got. So um, modules on calming your emotions, knowing what to say, focusing on solutions, returning to the workplace um, and tips for getting through. So today's talk is actually based um, on that. So if you'd like to read some more, um, please do so after this. Um, I share this statistic here that since the beginning of this pandemic, we've had 19,000 hits to this web page. Um, the reason why I tell you this is to take away some of that stigma around um, getting some extra help and learning some new tools um, because COVID is really difficult. It is stressful. It is anxiety provoking. It's hard. Um, and so lots and lots of people are out there looking for some extra tips. Um, so please remember that it's not just you. A lot of people are feeling that way. So how do we know when extra support is needed and how to go about getting it? So you might benefit from extra support if um, your emotions are intense or, or overwhelming. So for example, it's normal for all of us to be feeling um, a bit sad from time to time or for us to experience dips in mood. But if you're noticing that your sadness um, is a lot more intense than usual or that you're just feeling overwhelmingly low, you're crying a lot, you're just feeling so blue and so helpless, that might be a sign. If your emotions are uncontrollable or un unmanageable, so for example, if you're noticing that you're getting um, anxious really easily more than usual, or if your anxiety and worry is through the roof and you're finding that it's really difficult to switch off from it or to bounce back as quickly as you normally would, that might be another sign. If you find that your um, emotions are going on for longer than usual, so rather than feeling a bit sad or a bit anxious and then um, getting back to baseline, if you're noticing that it's just going on and on for days um, or even weeks and that it's uh, you're feeling like that for much of the day, for most days, um, then that could be a sign that um, extra help is, is probably going to be helpful. If it's affecting your sleep, um, your appetite, your weight or other aspects of your health, often that's the first sign that we notice that we're finding it hard to sleep or we don't feel like eating or maybe we're overeating. And of course, if your emotions are getting in the way of you doing day-to-day -day things, if you're finding it hard to focus, um, to work, um, to take care of the kids, um, if you're not feeling like your usual self or if other people are noticing changes within you, so often other people might notice that we might be more irritable than usual, for example. Or other people might actually express concern and they might say, look, I'm just a bit worried about you. You don't seem, um, you don't seem like you're coping as well as you normally are. All of these might be signs um, that getting some professional support um, could be an asset for you. So getting a mental health checkup with your GP or another health professional um, can be really beneficial. Um, we get uh, physical health checkups, but how many of us go and get mental health checkups? Um, do it early before the problem escalates and gets out of control. And if you're in a position where you're in lockdown and you can't leave the house, or whether um, you've got a chronic health problem or for whatever other reason you don't feel comfortable leaving the home, 
rather than not accessing help at all, do be asking for telehealth options. So appointments and sessions can be done over the phone or via video conferencing. So for example, here at CRUFAD, my colleagues and I, for the most part, are actually conducting our sessions over video conference rather than getting our clients to come in um, to the hospital. Your GP can assess whether you are eligible for a mental health care plan under Medicare. So what this means is that you'll be entitled to up to 10 sessions per calendar year, where um, the bulk of the uh, fee will be paid by Medicare to see a clinical psychologist and you'll pay a gap, a gap payment. Um, another alternative to seeking help is online courses. So um, This Way Up, so www.thiswayup.org.au. This is what our landing page looks like. Um, but next month, if you log in, it might look a little bit different because we're actually doing a revamp of our website. But this is what it's, it's looking like right now. Um, there are 18 um, online courses that we offer. So wellbeing courses about coping with stress, um, improving your sleep, transdiagnostic courses, which basically mean, means that the one course is addressing both, both low mood and anxiety, and then disorder specific courses for just depression or different kinds of anxiety conditions um, or worries that, that people might have, such as health anxiety um, or chronic pain or, or panic attacks. Now, because we have a lot of courses on offer, it can be confusing to know which one would be most suitable for you. So my encouragement would be to have that um, mental health checkup with your GP to try and get an understanding of what's going on for you. Or you can go to our courses um, webpage and have a read of the description for each. Or you can take a test. Um, so basically um, on our website, you can fill in a few brief questionnaires and at the end of that, a suggestion or suggestions of a course or courses will be made to you of, of which one might be most suitable and can help point you in the right direction. Uh, so why consider an online course? Um, so an online course, um, all of our online courses actually are based on cognitive behaviour therapy or CBT. And uh, this is basically um, a type of therapy where you learn some really practical skills to manage your emotions um, and learn more helpful ways of dealing with your thoughts and your behaviours um, and also some physical sensations that you might have to do with um, low mood or anxiety. All the courses are evidence-based, um, meaning that um, there's a lot of clinical trials that we run on our courses um, and worldwide, a lot of, um, there's a lot of evidence now to show that not only is CBT helpful, but online CBT courses are also helpful. Our courses range from between four to six or eight sessions long. Um, so you could actually complete them within weeks or months. Um, they're accessible from anywhere you've got um, internet access they're convenient, so you can work um, on them in your own time from home. They're low cost, so some of our courses are free and some of them are $59, which is actually a lot cheaper than seeing a psychologist. And there's also no waiting list. So if you logged in onto our website this afternoon, um, spent five minutes registering, you could actually start lesson one immediately. Um, our courses are widely used and I also, um, for the sake of taking away that stigma I spoke about before, during the start of, since the start of COVID, we've actually had a significant increase in the number of um, people registering and using our courses, actually a 700% increase. Um, so once again, this just goes to show that this pandemic um, is really challenging. Um, lots of people um, are really benefiting from learning some extra tools. Um, and if that's, if that's you, that you're just needing a little bit of extra support to cope, um, please give yourself permission to do that rather than having that stigma placed on yourself. And on that note, I just want to wish you all the best. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's another Amanda here, Amanda Bavin, Head of Marketing and Communication at GMHBA. Um, a massive thank you for all the insights you've delivered today. Uh, in terms of further questions that the audience might have, if you could put that into the web chat function, that would be excellent. Uh, I have one for you, though, Amanda, before you take off, and that is... Um, all these courses and tips are really helpful for adults, uh, but what do you suggest you do with um, primary school children in particular who might be finding uh, this whole pandemic a bit anxiety inducing? Like, what, what are your tips for dealing with kids? 
Uh, that's a great question. So um, I think about it in a similar way to what I discussed before in terms of media exposure. We don't want to go to the one extreme mm. of completely not speaking to children about what's going on. Um, and at the same time, we don't want to go to the other extreme of just constantly talking about it and giving them too much information and perhaps even inducing anxiety because there's so much focus um, so much focus on COVID. And so I think what's really important with children mm. is to be um, giving them enough information so that they understand what's happening. Um, so it can be confusing for children to understand why they can't be at school at the moment. Why do they have to do online learning from home? Why can't they visit um, grandma and grandpa and give them a hug? Um, why does school have to suddenly shut down and be closed? Why are mum and dad working from home? Um, their worldview is as being completely turned upside down at the moment. And so it's important that um, enough of an explanation is being given to them so they understand what's happening. And that the amount of detail that's being given to children is developmentally appropriate. So um, for younger children, you might wanna speak um, in simpler and more general terms. Whereas um, as children get older, you might wanna be giving them a little bit more detail um, that's appropriate to where their level of development is at. I think it's also really important to um, be keeping an open dialogue with children where you're allowing them an opportunity to talk about how um, COVID is affecting them. So a lot of children are probably feeling very scared very confused, they might be sad, they can't see their friends or their family as often. Um, so I think being able to allow them to speak about that and being able to validate or acknowledge whatever it is that they're feeling. So coming back to that first tip I spoke about that your experience is your experience, um, that, that every single child's experience of COVID is also going to be different as well. And giving them that space to be able to process that, to be able to talk about it, um, I think will will be good, not just for them, but also, um, you know, whether you're a parent or a teacher or, or someone else who's got kids in their lives, um, that will actually be really helpful for your attachment and your relationship. Because what we do want is we want children to feel like it's safe enough to approach us with questions. And we want um, children to also feel like they can come to us and talk to us about what, what's bothering them as well. Does that answer Fantastic. your question, Amanda? Thanks. Yes, it does. And highly relevant when you've got primary school children in the midst of um, working from home. So thank you. That was really, really helpful. Uh, we don't have any more questions coming from the audience at this point. So what I think we might do is actually wrap it up. Um, thank you so much again, and thank you to Sue Rankin, our board member, for um, hosting today. We've now got a couple of poll questions that will pop up on your screen. Uh, these polls are really valuable for us to shape what we do in the future with these activities and programs. So if you could just slot in some of your answers, that would be great. And in the meanwhile, I'll um, talk a little bit about our next webinar that's coming up. Uh, that will be on the 20th of August at 12.30 p.m. And we'll be hearing from Dr. Kate Gregorovich, a geriatrician and internal medicine physician. She'll be exploring the topic of immediate motivation, how physical activity can improve your well-being today. So today, we've, I guess we've tackled off on the mental health side of things, but yeah, next week will be um, focused on mental uh, physical activity. So please tune into that one. And um, if you could do the poll, that would be much appreciated. Uh, Sue, do you have any closing comments from your perspective that you'd like to close out today's session with? Thanks, Amanda. I just really encourage everyone who has tuned in today to take note of Amanda's great presentations and never, ever be afraid to, to reach out and get help. Um, this, is a, this, this is uncharted waters we're in at the moment. And if we can get early help to anyone, it makes a real difference. So please reach out to your GP or a psychologist, do some of the courses that Amanda has suggested um, and, and take on board uh, the comments that have been raised. And most importantly, be gentle on yourself. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thanks. Bye-bye.